Welcome back to Enthador, ladies and gentlemen, where time forever marches on. I'm Marcus Aurelius, and this is Dwarf Fortress version 0.43, and we are the town of Forest Home. And we are still cleaning up after that last siege with the goblins in the last episode. It feels like months have passed. I don't know exactly if they have or not. But we're now the almost the 12th month of the 165th year. So we're the same year, but we're almost into the next year. You can see that we have a ton of citizens who are cleaning things up here. We're also expanding the road, or I should say floor, around the city in order to prevent trees from growing. And that's what most of our people are doing now. We feel relatively safe because the goblins were just fought off. Now, of course, a were beast or a mega beast can attack at any time. They don't care what season it is. And if such a thing happens, we might lose a far larger portion of our peasantry than we would normally expect. But I'm thinking it won't happen. I haven't seen much in the way of crazy attacks in a while. And I'm wondering if our two fortresses so far have denuded a large portion of the mega beast population of the world of Enthador. We'll see. And what's interesting is when you've killed enough mega beasts, the age of the world changes. Right now we're in the age of myth, I think. And then you go to the age of legends. Then you go to the age of dwarves or humans, depending on what happens, which is kind of interesting. But one of the reasons why I brought you back is because we're in the middle of a tavern brawl, very similar to the one that led to the near destruction of our fortress sand pillar. And I thought you might want to check that out. It all started when a dancer... A goblin dancer, Axmu Zolaxmesp, was trying to sleep in the pile of alcohol behind the bar. And he was interrupted by a siege engineer, that is Vargas. And Vargas started picking a fight with them. I guess Vargas was like, what are you doing sleeping in the booze, you crazy goblin? Maybe his passions were high because we just got into a battle with goblins. And so maybe he's just kind of prejudiced against goblins in general. I don't know. But he started fighting with this poor goblin. And it looks like the goblin's winning. Look at there's spatterings of Vargas' blood all over the place. And someone named Catton, there's spatterings of his blood too, or her. I don't see Catton though. Is this Catton? All right, so a dancer named Catton was also bleeding. And this person, Catton, is running away. Let's see here. His ability to grasp is somewhat impaired. He requires diagnosis, and Dwarf Comic brought him to rest in bed. The second of Hematite. I don't know how long ago that was. I don't know the Dwarven months perfectly. I've been injured badly. There is no hope, says Catton. She feels hopeless after suffering a major injury. She is afraid after experiencing trauma. She feels satisfied upon improving fighting. <laughs> she feels vengeful when joining a distant conflict. Okay, so we have a existing conflict here. She's fleeing from it. Everybody else is kind of just chilling. Then we have Vargas. What's going on, Vargas? Vargas also has his ability to grasp somewhat impaired. He's never had an injury before. I've been injured badly. Wah! Vargas is a woman as well. She is terrified while in conflict. She's shaken after suffering a major injury. All right. So I guess this goblin dancer is really getting the best of everybody. Let's see here. No health problems whatsoever. Although it looks like he was brought to rest in bed earlier by Kaelin Orkenshield, our gem cutter. Axmu is lost in rage. He feels euphoric due to inebriation. He feels satisfied upon improving fighting. He is exhilarated after being attacked. He doesn't feel anything after experiencing trauma. Wow, this is one tough goblin. But it does say he has a right upper arm bruise, a right foot bruise, a spleen bruise, a lower body bruise, a left hand bruise, and a head bruise, which didn't show up in the wounds screen. Look at this. Catton is his apprentice. Okay, so Catton noticed that her boss was being attacked by our siege engineer and jumped in to defend him, got a little messed up, and now is like, piecing out. Catton just doesn't want any more to do with this because it's a tough fight, I guess. And and now it's Catton running away while Amz, Amzu 
and Vargas, our siege engineer, are fighting it out. This is rough. He's a member of the Secret of Horns of Love. <laughs> I think that's the group. I think that's the uh, the troop that I allowed to stay in our fortress because their name was so cool. The Secret of Horns of Love. I figured we needed some kind of crazy sex troop just <laughs> making things interesting in Forest Home. <laughs> All right, so what's going on? Let's just see exactly what's happening here. Bullrake and Stonefang are fighting. Wait, the Bullrake, Latast, Mommex? More, what the hell's a Bullrake? Oh, is, is that, is Bullrake one of our mercenaries? Huh. I'm not seeing Bullrake anywhere here. Although Bullrake is actually the... It would actually be the um, profession, right? Not... So there's Stonefang, Agate, Kitty Cat, Axe Lord... No bull rakes. Huh. These are all of our people. Where are our... Ah, there's one of our, our human pikemen, Posa Ramatalat. Butcher Pete's over there. There's Arrow Lem Huhu Thral, our human hammerman. Erdim Sibrek the Last, our Spear Dwarf, Mercenary. There's Gregor Stoneside and Slavaj Zizek, Peas Soup. There's our Human Lasher, Anthath Tinleba. Thank you for all you do for our fortress, my friend. I don't know what a Bullrake is. I'm confused. But regardless, but we're looking at Vargas here, right? And there's also Bid Bicta Dot Olershi. Dot Olershi? The human bard. Okay, so Vargas. Let's see. Oh boy, Vargas isn't doing too well here. There's 11 pages of stuff. Okay, so Vargas punches the dancer in the right foot with her right hand, bruising the muscle through the cow leather sandal. Okay, so Vargas, I guess, started this. This is a fight. I laugh in the face of death, says Vargas. So then Vargas charges at the goblin dancer and knocks the goblin dancer over. Vargas keeps trying to attack the Goblin Dancer, but the Goblin Dancer is avoiding Vargas quite adequately. Finally, the Dancer punches Vargas back and knocks him over. He stands up, so the Dancer is apparently a much better combatant than Vargas. Although, it looks like Vargas punches the Dancer in the lower body with her left hand, bruising the muscle and bruising the guts. This might have been where her spleen injury came from. The Dancer looks sick. The dancer is having trouble breathing after Vargas punches her in the lung. The siege operator charges at the human bard. The siege operator collides with the human bard. Okay, so now Vargas is like, I have improved my fighting. That was not satisfying. And he decides to attack the human bard as opposed to the goblin dancer. Knocks the human bard over. At this point, the goblin dancer is just pissed off. Becomes enraged. Starts wailing on... Well, actually doesn't attacks Vargas, but Vargas seems to be avoiding it for the most part. Vargas is punching the goblin. It seems like Vargas is getting the better of the goblin. I don't know, maybe the goblin's just wearing better... Yeah, wearing leather. Maybe Vargas is wearing cloth. I'm not sure, but it's not having the effect here. Then Vargas keeps trying to knock people over. He knocks the dancer over. The dancer, remember now, is the goblin. The bard is a human. And it must be Catan? No, wait, the bard is someone else completely differently. Okay, now Vargas looks sick because the Goblin Dancer punches him in the lower body, bruising the muscle and bruising the guts. So Vargas is vomiting all over the place here. He's looking really sick. His guts are incredibly bruised, or her guts are incredibly bruised. Looks like at this point, this is when the Goblin starts getting the, the better of Vargas. 
And now Vargas is vomiting all over the place. But still has enough energy to charge once more at the Dancer and knock him over. The Dancer is having trouble breathing. Okay, stuff is happening here. Looks like Vargas charges at the Dancer another time, knocks him over. But Vargas is pooped. He falls over out of exertion. And then the Goblin is basically wrestling him now. And he's got his hold on his teeth. And Vargas can't even barely move. He's vomiting all over the place. And it looks like now that the Goblin Dancer is getting the better of him. Because basically Vargas has no energy. Now what's Catan doing? Catan is just vomiting and retching everywhere. And the Bard. What's the Bard doing? The Bard basically just was totally cool with being knocked over by Vargas. Bard just got up, wiped himself off, and went somewhere else and said, Nah, I don't want any uh, any part of this. So that's what's happening so far. And it continues to happen. Um, can I get my squad involved here? The Stonehills Slayers? Can we kill this goblin? No? So it's funny, we can kill some people. We can kill this random bard, Melbil Godenbunem, and Gazin Uririsha. We can kill a lot of people, but we just can't kill this one goblin. Huh, interesting. I wonder why that is. Oh, you know why? Because I believe he is a citizen now. No, hold on. He's a former member of the Mangy Spider, but he isn't anymore. It doesn't say that he's a member of the Tree of Wildness, though, which is our civilization. Yeah, it doesn't say. I'm not sure, but we're not able to kill him. So we're just going to let this fight kind of play itself out. There's Vargas retching. Okay, it looks like it has. Looks like Vargas is just sitting there kind of retching. Vargas is in pretty bad shape. Let's just take another quick look at him. Vargas. Oh, he's socializing. But he's shaken to the core. Or she. She is shaken to the core. But she is apparently not shaken too much to socialize. Any wounds? Left upper arm seems pretty messed up. Pretty much everything is sort of messed up. Let's take a look at that. Let's go to um, K, Vargas, health. All right, well, we can't really tell what exactly is wrong with Vargas until Vargas gets some treatment from a doctor. But there's a cheat around that where we can do this. And just kind of look. Her first toe, right foot is broken. Her first toe, right foot is smashed open. Her first toe, right foot is bruised. Her left ear is mangled beyond recognition. Her left upper arm is broken. Her left upper arm is bruised. Her right upper arm is bruised. Her upper body is bruised. Okay, so most of her is bruised. Her real injuries are her face, where her ear is mangled beyond recognition. So she's never going to be as pretty, I guess, as she was before. And her uh, right arm, her left arm, I'm sorry, is broken. That's her most serious injury, which needs to be stabilized. She dreams of raising a family, but has to survive this event first. All right, well, that's looks like that fight is over for now. So what else is new? I'm building a library because we've accumulated some codices and because our next fortress is going to be essentially a super library, I wanted to get some experience with libraries. So I've got this library currently being built and I'm building bookcases to put in it. So hopefully next episode you will see that. I'm also paving over everything. I'm continuing along that path. As you can see, things look pretty good. I've got this area worked out here for the water. I've channeled out everything above the lake. What I noticed is if you build a floor grate here and this area turns to ice, then the floor grates disintegrate upon... Well, they don't disintegrate, but they fall apart upon the ice turning back to water and they fall back into the lake. I made a whole bunch of grates and I covered all of this with grating. But unfortunately, when the ice turned back to water, all the grates fell down. So that didn't work. But this is the catch room in order to catch all the water, which goes into here. 
and I'm currently in the process of deconstructing the floors because apparently that's the only way to clean mud, which is ridiculous. There should be an easier way to do it, but I'm deconstructing the floors and rebuilding them such that I can get this brown mud out of our dining hall. I'm just doing it kind of one floor at a time. It's a kind of a nerve wracking and time consuming process, but you know how it is. I always try to keep them apart from each other so that two dwarves won't stand next to each other. Like one won't stand over the ground. The other one's working essentially. I can't even tell if that one has muds. So we'll just do this one first. There's still some actual liquid water running around here, which is kind of lame. And we'll do this one and this one. And let's go up here in this corner. And let's do either side of the door. Again, I'm just trying to keep them far enough apart so that the two dwarves aren't going to get in each other's way while they're deconstructing. Some of these are going to lead down here, so I don't want them to fall down. And I think I've already done that here, actually, outside, so I can rebuild our floor here out of diorite blocks. Beautiful. So that's how we're taking care of that problem. We're getting rid of all the wood down here. Again, if we get attacked by a minotaur or a dragon or something right now, it's going to be rough times for Forest Home. We'll probably lose a third of our population. But this road has to be built one way or another. We're vastly growing in our sheep, llama, and alpaca population. Um, let's see what else is new. We have some new artifacts. So we have Amugarist Thilseg Agoth. Or Fog Assaults, the Tarnish of Competing, which is a diorite crown built by Rand J. This is a diorite crown. All craft warp ship is of the highest quality. It is encircled with bands of oval, diorite cabochons, and cushion gneiss or genis cabochons. This object is adorned with hanging rings of copper. At least they're using some metal to make these worthwhile. On the item is an image of rectangular cabochons in diorite. On the item is an image of Kubuk, Counseled Helm, the dwarf, in yellow Zuc Zircon. I don't know who that is. It might be a noble of our society. And then I don't know if I told you about Bumalar, or Worried Meeting, which was a hazelwood amulet constructed by Lord Stone. And this is a hazelwood amulet. All craft dwarfship is, of course, of the highest quality. It is decorated with horse bone and menaces with spikes of mule bone and cave spider silk. Spikes of silk, that is definitely threatening. <laughs> On the item is an image of smooth pebbles in hazel wood. I guess Lord Stone really likes smooth pebbles. Actually, that makes sense with his name, Lord Stone. Maybe he really likes rocks. Which, I guess, makes sense for a dwarf, right? Dwarfs live underground. I presume that many of them are budding geologists of one form or another. On the item is an image of Splattered Savage, a cobaltite crown in hazel. So that must be another one of our... Another one of our things. Yeah, there it is. Splattered Savage. Now, here's the thing, though. Look at all these artifacts we have. We just have tons of artifacts. So, it's making me wonder why our artifact floor here doesn't have that many artifacts. We have an Ban Fastam. We have an artifact statue. We have these two artifacts. I think they're both toy axes. We have an artifact weapon rack. And then we have a chain and a chest. So that's about maybe half of the artifacts that we actually have. So I don't know. There's a way to find out. I mean, you can go to the stocks menu, which I hate doing because it takes forever because especially blocks takes forever. But you could theoretically go to, uh, as long as you stay away from blocks up there, because there's 15,000 of them since this is an above ground fortress and everything's being built with blocks. You want to go to, say, bracelets and go to tab. Oh, wow, we have a lot of copper crafts to give away if one of the traders will actually make it here in one piece. Okay, figurines, for example. We could kind of look through here. So there we go. Bobet Ust, right? So this is a artifact figurine, is it not? Yeah, it's a large figurine. It's amazing. It's got all kinds of stuff on it. So where is it? Let's, uh... Zoom to it. Okay, so it's it's just sitting here in the craft store's workshop. So I don't see any reason why 
somebody wouldn't come. There it is. Why somebody wouldn't come, pick it up, and take it to where it's supposed to be. There's no reason why not. It's just sitting there in the workshop. These dwarves, they have no respect for our traditions and our heritage. Or it could be that I'm just working them to the bone. As you can see here, there's very few idlers. I took away all job duties from Krug Smash as he was walking out here, moving wood down here. And um, we definitely don't want our Baroness to be killed by a random wandering mega beast or goblin ambush or whatever. Although now I, I seem to have lost her. Is she at home? Apparently not. Nice little house though, right? I mean, we've definitely made it nice for her. She is, for the moment, content. We still have to make one more slab. Why aren't we making it? It's, it's on the docket. I don't understand why they can't do it. All right, so I'm trying something here. You know how there used to be the workflow plugin, and now in the game itself, it has a workflow situation. So I have construct diorite blocks, and it's got some conditions. So basically, the way I'm hoping this will work is that when the number of diorite blocks I have drops below 200, then, so I, I changed this to start to say at least 200, which makes no sense to me. Like, why would you create a work order where you produce something once there is 200 of it? So that basically means you'll never produce it, right? Because let's say you have 10 of it and your work order says, don't produce it until we have 200, then you don't do crap. Or if you have above 200, then you infinitely make more. That seems like a very foolish work order. So I don't know why it doesn't automatically start with at most, but it starts with at least. Unless I am not understanding this correctly, that's really weird. So I changed it to at most, which as far as my logic understands, what this means is once we get below 200, let's say we get to 199, then this job will start, which basically says construct infinite blocks until we reach 200. That's my thought. I don't know if it'll work or not. I might be completely misunderstanding the scenario. But if we look here at our workshops, you will note that there is no order right now to construct blocks. So at least for right now, it appears to be working. And why is there just a random... Oh, I know why. Because I probably made a hole. Yep, made a hole in the ground right there. It happens. All right, blocks. All right, blocks. All right, blocks. They're doing this really quickly, so good on them. Good on them. The water, for one reason or another, I recall it evaporating faster in the past than it does now. It seems to be taking quite a long time to evaporate. But whatever. Once all that's done, we'll try that again. Although in the winter time, when everything gets frozen, I wonder if it'll break my whole system. I hope not. Like if the water's running when the winter time comes. Anyway, we're almost out of time, so let's profile a dwarf. Oh man, I haven't, I haven't set this up. I should have thought better. We're at 350 right now, and just to let you guys know, we have names through 565. We actually just put the name up today, so thank you, nice man, for watching this series like five months after I started it. But what this means is basically we, can, we only have about 200 more names, and since this fortress already has gone to... 200. That's maybe one more fortress, and I have at least two more that I've planned. So that's kind of interesting. 350, and I think 158, I want to say, is where old Skunky is. 158. God, I am a genius. So 158 to 350. 346. So almost near the end. Oh. What happened? Gregor Stoneside has grown attached to an iron shield. That's cool. All right. What was it again? 346. Seneca. We've already done Seneca. Whoa. That seems kind of unrandom. 289. And I know I say that all the time. The number is kind of strange. And then someone will invariably respond in the comments. Well, that's what makes it random. Because you can get the same number twice in a row. If you never got the same number twice in a row, it wouldn't be random. Yes, I understand. It's just, I kind of expect random to be, like, scattered. So when 
two things right next to each other or the same number get called up twice, while that still is technically random and fits the criteria, it just makes my mind kind of go, hmm. 289. Grand Paso. Grand Paso. Let's take a look at our boy or girl, Grand Paso. Grand Paso is currently unassigned. Grand Paso Cadolurus is storing an item in a stockpile, which is a noble task and one we need many, many people to do. Grand Paso is a woman. And she worships Stag's Hill and Doran. We have shrines to both of them now, so everything's cool. But no family. Wow, another dwarf with no family. And really no real true friends. Just a number of people who are on friendly terms with Grand Paso. And that's kind of funny, because Grand Paso's been here for a while. I mean, she's been here for a hundred dwarves worth of migrants. So you think she would have made some friends at this point. She is a passing acquaintance with the Lady Consort. Yeah, weird. No enemies, though, so that's always great. I'm curious. Tell me everything. Okay, Grand Paso. That's probably why Grand Paso doesn't have any friends, because she just bugs everybody. And they're like, leave me alone. <laughs> Within the last season, she didn't feel anything after seeing a goblin die, because the Grand Paso witnessed the massacre of the goblins in the previous ambush. Well, invasion. She did feel satisfied after getting into an argument. She was uneasy after a lack of decent meals. Really? We should have plenty of meals. She was blissful dining in the legendary dining room. She definitely has a lot of feelings. Like compared to the average dwarf that we profile, this is a ton of feelings. She was disgusted after retching on a miasma. Yeah, I could see that. It's basically just her not feeling anything when a bunch of goblins die though. Okay, so she's a dubious worshiper of Stag's Hill and a worshiper of Doran. So she kind of likes Doran better. Doran is the god of mountains, and Stag's Hill is the god of hunting. So that seems dwarfy to me. I mean, you would probably care more about the mountain god than the hunting god, especially since in none of my fortresses do I ever allow people to hunt. Let's see. She is 57 years old, born in the 9th of Malachite in the year 108. She is tall and fat. Her nose is incredibly upturned. Her very long hair is tied in a ponytail. She has a scratchy voice. Her eyelashes are short. Her hair is mahogany. Her skin is dark peach. Her eyes are aquamarine. She's very quick to tire. So she's not an incredibly attractive dwarf. That might also be contributing to the fact that she doesn't have any friends. But apparently she has really pretty aquamarine eyes. So, you know. Um... Does have a bit of an upturned nose, which implies a bit of snootiness. Grand Paso likes basalt, iron, rubicel, alpaca wool. Well, you're going to get plenty of that here. Training spears, bucklers, rings, rabbits for their ability to burrow, and vultures for their patience. When possible, she prefers to consume peach, cider, cottonseed oil, and kaniwa flour. She absolutely detests toads. She has a good spatial sense and a good memory. She personally believes that self-mastery and the denial of impulses are of the highest ideals, so she's very stoic. She views cooperation as a low ideal, not worthy of any respect. Again, why she probably doesn't have a lot of friends. And she thinks the quest for knowledge is a delusional fantasy and respects power. Huh. She is currently more rude. She has a greedy streak. Okay, well this all explains why she doesn't have any friends. This is strange, though. Is this new? Overall, Doran is unfocused by unmet needs. Doran is the god, right? This is Grampasso. Grampasso Gemfells. I don't know. She is unfocused after being unable to take it easy. She is unfocused after being unable to pray to Doran. Which doesn't make sense, because there is a lovely... Lovely little shrine to Doran. Right here. All visitors welcome, dedicated to Doran. There you go. I wish it would say, when you first set up the temple, it tells you how many citizens of your fortress. It doesn't have to be citizens, I don't think, because I've noticed that a bunch of new gods have been added so like when a bard shows up and they worship a god that's not part of my civilization, that god will show up on the list. And it'll show you how many people worship that god. 
I think it's kind of sad that once you've actually created the temple, it doesn't give you that information. Because it does when you're first setting it up. If you're assigning the location, it will tell you how many dwarves worship that particular god. So for example, if you want to make the temple first that's going to make the most dwarves happy, you can do that. But that's that, folks. We're almost out of time. Well, actually, we are out of time. 30 minutes. So once again, I am Marcus Aurelius. I'd like to thank you very much for joining me in these Tales of Enthador. This particular fortress, I wanted to make sure each series is about 30 episodes, but I'm thinking this one might go a little bit further because the temple is not complete yet. Fully. Not the temple, but the pyramid, which encloses the temple. There's a few other things I want to do still, and I still want to get a really great farming and cloth and animal industry going on so I could kind of showcase that for newer players who want to know how to get that to work. So this might go beyond 30 episodes, plus I've been requested to do another history episode, which I'd love to do myself anyway. So, but we'll see. I mean, it won't, it won't go too far beyond 30 because we have another fortress to do after this one. But I do want this to look really cool, and of course we still have to look at it in 3D once it's all complete and beautiful. So once again, once again, once again, I'm Marcus Aurelius. I'd like to thank you very much for watching. Have a good one.